Uh, next up, we have Dr. Morteza Amadi um, with the presentation. Dr. Amadi completed his PhD at the University of Waterloo in Systems Design and Engineering, where he focused on the design and fabrication of medical devices and sensors. Dr. Amadi is a co-founder and CEO of Kidney Labs and focuses on research surrounding the development of the next generation of renal replacement therapies. All right, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Kidney Labs. It's a startup company in Waterloo. Medical devices completely focused on development of an implantable renal replacement therapy. Um, so the company was started in 2014. Uh, always one of the lucky people who, so my background, I'm a bioengineer, and I was lucky that I received training at Kidney Foundation of Canada as a Crescent Fellow um, with a group of nephrologists for a couple of years. Uh, and that's how I got introduced to this market and this problem to solve. And, and then when I graduated, I started the company in 2014. Now, <clears throat> that's a little background uh, about the company. Uh, Peter explained the problem. I'm just going to review it very quickly in terms of how industry look at this problem. So in, in U.S. alone, there are about 650,000 patients with end-stage renal disease, uh, about 100,000 patients on the waiting list for a kidney transplant, and there are only about 20,000 kidney transplants available each year. So there's a huge demand uh, for kidneys and not much supply. So dialysis was invented in 1943 by Dr. Kolf. It has been saving many lives since then, but uh, the point is there hasn't been much uh, development in terms of changing technology or having a better technology since then. Uh, current technology, imagine yourself attached to a dialysis machine uh, with not much hope uh, for the future. You're watching your own blood circulating in plastic tubes. Uh, very high mortality rate of about 60% in five years, and the cost of dialysis is very, very high, about on average $82,000 per patient per year. So from industry point of view, that $82,000 per patient per year is an opportunity, meaning that it creates a huge market of about $70 billion um, per year in U.S. alone, which is increasing to about $100 billion uh, by 2020. Now, the question is, if the market is that huge, why there is no new option for about 70 years? So that's what I'm going to address in the in, in next few slides. So there are a few challenges. Uh, for bringing a medical device like this to market, uh, which is the reality that you see in the industry. And when you look at it from a technical point of view, technology is probably only 20, 25% of the problem. So I quickly just review some of that. Uh, there are technical problems, financial challenges, regulatory and reimbursement. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, you see kidney is this complex organ, and it is very, very difficult to mimic and build a new uh, device or a bionic kidney that can mimic that function. So 1% uh, of body mass, and, and it receives 25% of cardiac output. Uh, this is from engineering point of view, of course. So the total blood of the body is circulated through kidneys every four to five minutes. Uh, it is amazing, so we have limited amount of blood in our body, but kidneys are filtering about 180 liters of filtrate uh, a day. And out of that, 178.5 liters are reabsorbed back into the system again. And only 1.5 liter is removed as urine. Now, if, you, if this system is only functioning 5% different, instead of 1.5 liter a day, you're gonna have nine liter of, of urine a day. And, and you can imagine how terrible that can be. So it, it, in, in terms of technology, it's a complex organ, uh, not so easy to, to mimic. Uh, there are financial challenges. When you think about an implantable device from idea stage to bringing it to market, um, it needs more than $100 million of investment. Uh, and it, it needs more than 10 years of hard work of a huge group of people completely focused on just one single product. So that is the financial challenge from investor point of view. That's a long-term uh, risky investment. From regulatory point of view, so uh, a device like this, when it's built, it has to be approved by regulatory agencies such as FDA. Now, from their point of view, it's a high-risk class three device. It has to go through pre-market approval, PMA, 
um, for safety and efficacy uh, based on what we do and what we know in, in, in preclinical stage, an implantable renal replacement therapy device or implantable artificial kidney has to be first used in, in large animal models with no renal function, such as uh, sheep or pigs with no kidneys, uh, for about 30 to 90 days before they allow you to test them in real patients. And you're going to have to test them in more than 200 patients uh, to, to get approval. What's more important is that in terms of industry point of view, company wants to make money at the end, so uh, it, the device has to be reimbursed by some sort of insurance. So this is, this is the current reimbursement program for dialysis in U.S. and other, companies, uh, uh, other countries, uh, and, and this is divided by different group of uh, different parts of uh, things that, that are reimbursed uh, for dialysis. Now, think about it. it, when you have a new device, it's probably not dialysis. It's also probably not going to be uh, a whole organ kidney transplant. So it, it is some new way of reimbursement that has to be defined for reimbursement. So uh, you see these type of challenges uh, on the way to build and commercialize a product from idea stage to market. Now, when, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be completely focused on that first challenge, which is technology challenge. Um, when we think about the dialysis market and building an artificial kidney, the question is, how do we innovate? What sort of problems do you want to solve that at the end of solving all these different challenges, at the end of spending $100 million in 10 years, you have a real solid product to bring it to market? So first, the data shows that mortality rate is high. Uh, so your problem has to attack this problem, uh, your, your, your solution has to attack this problem by, by finding a way to basically reduce the mortality rate. And there are studies which suggest that if patients have access to treatment more than three times a week, their regular hemodialysis, the patients may live longer. So that's number one. The second, when you look at the current technology, um, you do not see any sort of miniaturization. So these are current dialysis machines. Uh, hemodialysis machine, 160 pounds. This is a uh, home dialysis machine, um, 70 pounds. This is a peritoneal dialysis machine, 26 pounds. These are, these are still huge machines. If you want to build an implantable artificial kidney, it has to be super small. In terms of weight, we're talking about a few hundred grams, less than a pound for sure. So that, that sort of miniaturization has to happen. So these are, these are some ideas that, okay, this is the direction of innovation. So definitely miniaturization has to happen there. So uh, let's think about, for example, a problem with arrhythmia. Um, pacemaker is a very good example. People could miniaturize it to a scale that they can implant it. So we hope same thing happens to dialysis machine that you can miniaturize it to a point that can implant that. Now, the current options available are either variable or implantable. Um, and for wearable devices, um, like what Peter showed, uh, one of the ideas are wearable artificial kidney or WAK uh, by Dr. Gurin uh, UCLA. Basically, what it is is, is a, it's a hemodialysis machine with a with a dialysate regeneration system. What does that mean? So currently, when patients go to a hemodialysis center three times a week, four hours each time. For that four hours, they're going to need about 120 liters of dialysate fluid. So that means that there has to be this system for purifying water to create 120 liters for four hours, or about half a liter per minute. Now, if you want to have a variable device, you can't carry 120 liters for four hours, right? So there has to be a system that with a limited amount of dialysate, the system, the kidney functions, and then at the same time, you can regenerate that dialysate that you have so that it functions over long term. And that's where um, uh, there's, there's technology called sorbent technology developed a few decades ago that's used to regenerate that saturated dialysate uh, to use it again for hemodialysis. Um, now, of course, that point of miniaturization, it is there in this technology. Um, it, it's probably one order of magnitude smaller than a current hemodialysis machine, but still a long way to go, as you can see. Um, so the other technology you can see, 
there's a company called AWAK. They're building a pre tunnel dialysis machine and um, with the dialysis regeneration system. So same idea, again, miniaturization, um, and uh, it's a variable device, uh, but the dialysate is being uh, regenerated. Now, the next category of technologies that people are trying to develop are implantable. Of course, um, Peter mentioned this. This is forced by Dr. Austin Hallwood, and um, they are decellularizing rats' kidneys, um, and when they bleach the cells, they, they have a scaffold, and then they repopulate that with kidney cells, and then they implant that. So that's one way of building a new kidney. Um, the other way is uh, a method using 3D printing. Now, you kind of print cell by cell, and building a complex organ by just printing cell by cell is going to be very difficult. It's going to take a lot of time. The main issue here is that uh, kidney has this huge vascular structure, and building all that vascular structure is going to be very difficult. Uh, it needs a lot of time. So uh, based on what they discussed in their paper, um, if you want to build a kidney using 3D printing technology, first you should be able to 3D print other things which are easier than kidney first. And so we think this is going to happen in the next 20, 25 years. It's not going to be available uh, anytime soon. Um, the other project, uh, it's UCSF implantable by artificial kidney. Um, it's a device that's based on hemofiltration, removing a hemofiltrate uh, from blood continuously, and then having kidney cells reabsorb uh, what's needed for the body back and separating uh, the toxins and some fluid. So this system is based on silicon nanofilters. So they have built silicon nanofilters which have pore size with the range that it blocks passage of albumin and uh, it keeps the proteins in blood, but at the same time, it removes a lot of solutes with some fluid uh, from blood. Now, my story started here. When we started testing silicon nanofilters in Waterloo, um, and so we, we purchased some silicon nanofilters 30 nanometers thick um, with pore size within the range of 5 to 15 nanometers. And we built a miniaturized blood dialyzer using those nanofilters. And we tested them with human whole blood. So it was a miniaturized blood dialyzer, uh, and we got permission from university to collect blood from volunteers. My lab mates hated me that time. Um, and we collected blood, uh, we tested that, and uh, we published a paper on that. Now, various factors you have to look at when you're testing a new blood dialyzer. One is solute filtration. Uh, we checked for various solutes, uh, removing various solutes using the system. We looked at hemolysis to see if they're introducing any blood damage to, uh, to, to, to blood. Uh, and then you look at hemocompatibility. Silicon is, a, is not a biocompatible material. It is not blood friendly. So what you have to do is you have to coat silicon with a blood compatible material, in this case, it's a polymer polyethylene glycol. Uh, we did that without blocking any sort of nanopores. Um, and you see some blood cells in, 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 um, on, on that nanofilter. You, you also got to test for other things such as cell adhesion. These are some leukocytes on the um, non coated membrane on the left, and then on the right. This is the polyethylene glycol coated membrane. Now, at the end, uh, we noticed two things. One, the polymer is going to wash off after a while uh, when you use this with, with blood. So, blood introduces some sort of uh, shear stress to the surface. It's going to wash off that coated polymer. The second one was that silicon is a brittle material. So, if you think about it, if you want to implant a material that's brittle, uh, it's going to break over uh, long term, and that's not, a good, that's not gonna be suitable as an implantable device. So these are the two factors that we noticed when we were developing that device, and so we decided 
uh, to look at it more carefully. So this is a scanning electron microscope of a silicon nanofilter, which was used to dialyze human whole blood. And as you see, there are some fractures in various areas which happen under the sheer stress of blood. So that's, that's the fracture issue. Uh, other people also have looked at this. Uh, their solution was that to put a frame, some sort of frame structure below the membrane so that it kind of uh, not allow any sort of fracture. But what we realized was that the problem is more fundamental. It's coming from the material itself. Uh, there's something called fracture toughness. It's a property of the material. It means that if this material has any sort of micro crack in it, what sort of forces do you need to apply? How much force do you need to apply to, to break that structure? Meaning that that micro crack is going to create a larger crack and finally cause fracture. So we looked at this property and we realized that if you use silicon as the base for a membrane for blood dialysis, um, silicon has low fracture toughness, so at some point there's going to be some sort of fracture, so probably that's not going to be very useful for, for, for an implantable device that you're looking at reliability over long term. So these are all different materials which have larger values in terms of fracture toughness, so we decided to start building new technologies, nanofilters, that function over long term and they're reliable and they don't break. So that was the basic idea when we started the company. Now, we also had this vision that, okay, uh, currently patients have to go to dialysis three times a week, so uh, what you see is that there's some sort of fluctuation in terms of uh, the level of uremic toxins in their body three times a week. Um, so it goes up, and then in four hours of hemodialysis, it drops, and then it goes up, it drops, and this happened three times a week. Now, our vision in the company is to keep the level of uremic toxins and fluids at a very safe level at all times continuously, and um, so that's, that's the vision behind what we do. There is this interesting idea published in 2005 uh, by Dr. Ronco in Italy and a group of other scientists, which explained that if you use two, two nanofilters together, you can, you can build an artificial kidney. What does that mean? It means that if you have a membrane, they call it G-membrane on top, where you can do some sort of hemofiltration and you remove some, some fluid uh, through convective forces, and that fluid uh, has everything in it but not proteins such as albumin. So it means that it is selectively removing some solids and molecules is smaller than uh, albumin, which is about 7.2 nanometers. If you do that, then you can have a second filter, which is called T-membrane, which reabsorbs what you want into blood back again. Now, remember that uh, challenge, first challenge I mentioned, that when kidneys work, they're removing 180 liters of filtrate, but they reabsorb about 178.5 of that fluid back again. So by combination, by using combination of two nanofilters, uh, you can build a kidney that do that. But uh, think about it, this is, this is just the basic idea. You have to be able to build a technology around this so that this device functions over the long term as an implantable device. So that's, that's the basic idea. So you have one nanofilter uh, using hemofilter one. You remove some fluids and then you process that filtrate uh, or that fluid and uh, you, 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 you make a concentrated uh, filtrate out of that which contain all sorts of uremic toxins uh, and you put that in bladder um, and what's n still necessary for, for body, you put it back into blood again using the second hemofilter. So that is the idea. Now the point is if, if you think about this, you're going to need uh, a very specific nanofilter for this. And there are three properties needed for that kind of nanofilter. It has to be very hemocompatible. So any sort of materials that you introduce to blood, there is always the chance of blood clot formation. So the nanofilter you built has to be very hemocompatible, very blood friendly. 
The second point is that it has to be durable. Remember I showed you a photo of a fractured silicon nanofilter. So that should not happen in an implantable device because the surgeon can't go back in there next week to replace the nanofilters, right? So it has to be very durable. And third, it has to mimic uh, the filtration properties of kidneys. And we built that technology after uh, five failures in the company. So, <clears throat> When we built that technology, uh, we started testing that with animal blood. So we work with a slaughterhouse, we collect fresh animal blood from them, and then we test the system with that to make sure. And these are some of the par parameters that we, we looked at. So we established the blood flow in the system, and then uh, we looked at the rejection of albumin, uh, because that's what kidneys do. Um, so you want to keep albumin in blood, not let albumin pass into the urine. The third point, uh, we detected the uremic toxins uh, in the filtrate, and we were also able to remove about 1.5 liter of fluid uh, a day, um, equ equivalent of that in, in the lab. So these are the parameters we checked. What's important is that <clears throat> all this sort of filtration is happening using normal blood pressure. So we did not uh, go beyond a normal blood pressure of, of human. Now we packaged uh, the nanofilters we built in a biocompatible casing, um, and, and this is the device. So, so we, we, we built um, an implantable renal replacement therapy device using that. So when we had that, uh, we decided to implant the device, and this is how it works. So the device is connected to iliac artery, iliac vein, and bladder, uh, blood is diverted from iliac artery into the nanofiltration system. Uh, the nanofiltration system removes the uremic toxins, um, and um, the rest of the the rest of the filtrate is, is back into blood again. Uh, the waste products go to bladder, and a patient would have a more normal life because uh, they do not need to do dialysis anymore. So this system is taking care of uh, cleaning blood for them. Now, when we had good results in the lab, we decided to do animal studies. Uh, for that, of course, you have to do an experiment protocol. You submit it to ethics committee. Uh, it gets approval. We did that at UCLA. This is uh, a real photo from the animal study uh, we performed. That's a living pig uh, in the operating theater. Um, and we, what we did was we first uh, removed uh, the kidney function uh, from the animal and then we fully implanted the device. Uh, now, uh, that is the osmosis. You see the connection uh, of the device to uh, the pig. And these are the samples we collected uh, from the animal in a short period of time. What we confirmed so far in our uh, pig animal model with no renal function is as following. So we performed a frocktomy, meaning that there was no renal function whatever we generated was completely based on our device. The second was that we performed the surgery to transplant kidney um, and we established the blood flow. Uh, always in the surgery, uh, when you touch the grafts, you can actually feel the pulse of the blood going into the system and coming out. So you establish blood flow and then you collect the sample. In the collected samples that uh, I just showed you, we confirm minimum level of albumin, uh, similar to kidneys. Uh, we also detected dermic toxins, um, and we also removed equivalent to 1.5 liter a day uh, from uh, pig's uh, body. So these are these are what we confirmed. Now, in um, my last slide, I'm going to just show you a quick video. So I'm going to show you a quick video from the real surgery. Uh, so the device was connected to the animal. This is uh, the moment that the very first sample is collected from the pig. Perfect dog lamp. Oh, just another one. Oh my goodness. Wow. Let's show it again. Perfect dog lamp. Oh, just another one. Oh my goodness. Wow. 
So you see, this is, this is the sample collected uh, from the pig. And below this blanket, there's a pig. Perfect dog plant. Oh, there's another one. Oh my goodness. Wow. All right. Uh, that's all. Thanks so much.